Our first speaker up tonight is Tara Felix. Tara is the Assistant Professor and Beef Extension Specialist from Penn State University. So welcome, Tara, and thank you for joining us tonight. And when you're ready, you can share your screen and we will get started. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you very much, Mary Lynn. It's an, an honor to be here. And I hope that my uh, blue and white color scheme won't throw the folks of New York <laughs> off this evening. Um, we, we just got done today with our extension annual conference. And um, you know, one of the last comments that, that I made for the conference and participation was that extension rallies together. And I'm happy to be here uh, to cheer on Cornell's extension efforts this evening. I was asked um, to talk about quite a few things this evening, and so I'm going to jump right in in the interest of time to try to, to keep to my 30 minute window. As Mary Lynn mentioned, if you have any uh, questions as I'm going along, feel free to use the chat pod. Um, I don't always see those when I'm typing, so if I don't get to them while I'm speaking, we'll, we'll be sure to get to those by the end. When uh, Mary Lynn asked me to put together this presentation for you all this evening, she asked me to talk a little bit about nutrition at different uh, points in the growing calf's life um, and economics and, and butchers. Oh boy. Um, so I'm going to try my best to cover all of those topics. Um, I'm going to warn you up front if I if I advertise a meeting about economics in Pennsylvania, nobody will show up. Um, so I am a nutritionist by training. I sprinkle in a little bit of economics and, um, but with nutrition and economics come numbers. And so if there's anything that you don't catch on the slides as we go through, uh, as Mary Lynn said, feel free to go back and review the recording or my email is tfelix at psu.edu. And you can always feel free to shoot me an email, ask me a question or request a copy of the slides. I'm happy to do that as well. When we start a conversation about nutrition, it's important to realize that whether we're talking about cows or pigs or dogs and cats, all animals, humans alike, require six distinct classes of nutrients. Those six classes of nutrients are water, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, minerals, and vitamins. Of those six classes, three provide energy to the animal, and those are carbohydrates, protein, and fat. Of course, we wouldn't want much protein to provide, be providing energy, but we know that protein in excess of the animal's requirements can uh, supply some energy and actually has an energy value similar to that of carbohydrates. Fat would have two and a quarter times more energy. However, when we feed the ruminant animal, um, we are limited in our inclusion of fat because that fat hinders fiber digestion in the rumen, which is one of the main benefits of feeding a ruminant animal, of course. So when we think about these cl six classes of nutrients, I, I prefer to think about these classes of nutrients as opposed to just thinking about the feeds. Because when we think about what the animal requires, the animal doesn't require hay, the animal doesn't require corn, the animal doesn't require soybeans, the animal requires simply these six classes of nutrients. And however we can supply those six classes of nutrients in the most economical way is all that matters at the end of the day. In our feedlot animals, there is a hierarchy of these six classes of nutrients being used every single day uh, with every single bite of feed that that animal takes. The very first thing in that hierarchy is that animal will always eat to maintain self. So before anything else can happen, that animal's maintenance requirements must be met. Um, now, uh, cattle have fairly high maintenance requirements due to the extensive nature of their gastrointestinal tract and their overall body size when compared to some of our other food producing animals. Uh, that said, cattle make up for that in their ability to utilize feeds that other animals can't and uh, more on that when we get to economics. Now, after maintenance requirements are met, after the animal is, is living, breathing, has enough energy to walk and maintain whatever tissue uh, flesh it has currently, um, then it can uh, continue through the rest of this hierarchy through development, bone growth, uh, tissue growth, uh, through muscular growth, and into the last hierarchy, which is fattening. 
Now it's important to point out in this hierarchy that we used to talk about cattle having to have age in order to fatten. We now have a much better understanding of this hierarchy and realize that this hierarchy is even happening through the dam's nutrition of that fetus in utero. We know then that we can move through that hierarchy from maintenance to fattening, from birth all the way to finish. And so how we manage those cattle early on can impact how they might grade on the rail for us uh, later on and, and can impact that not just back fat deposition, but intramuscular fat deposition that's going to affect our carcass quality. Now, when we think about this hierarchy of nutrients and how it's playing to um, develop the ideal carcass for us, which is the end result of our, our feedlot scenario, we have to think about that hierarchy from the get-go, from when that animal starts in the feedlot all the way to when it finishes. This is a graphic um, taken from Dr. Steve Lurch, who spent 30 years as a feedlot nutritionist uh, for Ohio State University. And I don't hold that against him, even though I'm at Penn State now. Uh, in fact, I have, have my PhD ties to Ohio State University. So this graph shows that upon feedlot entry, uh, cattle are consuming relatively small amounts of feed. And over the course of transition into that feedlot, um, intake will eventually uh, climb. However, it doesn't really begin to normalize or plateau um, where, where cattle might be considered at ad libitum intake until about 21 days into that uh, feeding period. Now, a lot of times during this 21 days, when we're talking about a beef calf system, part of the reason for that lengthy transition is the way that we manage beef cattle and the way that beef cattle systems work. We're bringing those calves in off of pasture from a forage-based diet and transitioning them to a grain-based diet. So that transition takes time. We're transitioning the animal, um, acclimating the animal to a new environment, to a new water source, away from the dam. We're acclimating the rumen microbes from, from a, a fiber dense diet to a, a fiber light diet. And so all that transition takes time. And after we get everything else acclimated, then intake can start to go up. Why is this important? And why is it important to focus so heartily on this intake uh, conundrum that's happening here early in the feedlot? Well, part of the reason that it's so important is because intake is going to drive all of our uh, profit centers in the feedlot. Uh, feed accounts for 65 to 70% of our input costs in any feeding system, whether it's on the cow-calf side or uh, and winter feed costs or whether it's on the, the feeder side. In addition, input intake is going to drive our body weight gain, which is our main economic driver uh, in the feedlot is, is that body weight conversion of, of intake to uh, gain and feed efficiency. So when we look at the body weight gain of the same group of animals, um, when those animals ship, there's an initial loss of weight from shipping. We know that that's called shrink, right? And, and we all get mad at the packer when they pencil shrink us too much. Um, but that is the reality of the situation. Cattle that are shipped will shrink. A lot of that is water loss. And so you see, as soon as they arrive at the feedlot, there's a, a slight beginning um, adjustment where they, they start to gain a little bit of that water loss back, but really they don't come back to um, the, in, the, the weight that they were prior to shipping until well after a week of that feedlot entry. So initially during this first week of feedlot entry, those animals are simply adjusting to the environment. Um, Dr. Mike Hubbard wrote an article for Drovers once that described uh, 25 mistakes made during this first week and how those mistakes often led to um, increasing this reduction on intake and, and uh, loss of gain during the first week of the feedlot. And we want to make sure that that's not um, the case in our systems. We want to be aware of, of those drivers and we could talk for an hour about how to properly transition animals. Um, but for this evening's presentation, I just want you to be aware of how these intake parameters are affecting everything else we're going to talk about. 
Now, after that first week, animals intake are still relatively low. However, the body is compensating at this point in time. And so we see a little bit more average daily gain occurring. However, that average daily gain does not begin to normalize again until when our feed intake starts to normalize. So we start to get on a more level trajectory of growth uh, after that 21 days when, when feed intake has kind of hit the, the norm, the, the comfortable ad libum intake for those cattle, then we start to see a more consistent line in those animals uh, and a more consistent weight gain increase. We can really screw this up by being bad bunk managers and not transitioning these cattle effectively. Um, this example demonstrates actually a very good initial transition and what uh, one might consider ideal and hope for. Now, when we're talking about animals, uh, Mary Lynn asked me to talk about four to six weights, uh, six to eight, and then eight to finish. And so I thought I would share this graphic. Um, this is a graphic that that depicts the average expected dry matter intake at, at different body weight groups. And the reason that I share the, it is that it's important to note that in the slide that we were talking about previously in the normal intake slide, we kind of normalize around that to maybe a little bit above 2%. Those animals that, um, that were at that 260 kilograms, it's about six weight animals, uh, could eat a little bit more than that and likely they would adjust after that 21 days up just a notch if we had followed them out. But this intake um, matters because at the end of the day, this intake is going to drive the pounds per day or grams per day consumption of those six classes of nutrients that are ultimately going to dictate um, the hierarchy of nutrient use or, or how those nutrients are used within that hierarchy. So let's give you an example of that. So here we have a 550 pound steer. This steer is consuming a 13% uh, crude protein diet. And I use the 550 pounds because that's roughly where we were at on those preliminary graphics of intake and body weight gain. This steer is consuming 3% of its body weight. So we've gotten past that initial 21 days. And um, what we need to know is how many grams of crude protein this steer is, is consuming. So how much of that protein um, is going to be used uh, in our hierarchy for maintenance, development, and then ultimately growth and fattening. In this case, um, I won't walk you through all the math. It's fairly simple. We take the, the body weight of the steer, multiply it by, I, I'm sorry, I left 3% on my slide. It should be 2.5% is what I did my math for. And we end up with 811 grams of crude protein. Now, if we calculate that same steer, and I made another mistake, this should be 550 pounds. This is what I get for changing my slides right before the talk. So if we take that same 550 pound steer, ignore Dr. Felix's lack of slide correction and calculate it at 1% of body weight. That steer is consuming five and a half pounds of feed and ultimately only 325 grams of crude protein. So same steer, two and a half percent of intake versus 1% of intake, and we differentiate um, a, a swing of about 500 grams of crude protein. Why am I hammering so much on this crude protein calculation? Well, I think protein is one of the prime examples of how uh, that hierarchy matters and why that hierarchy matters. And one of the easiest examples when we talk about growing cattle, because ultimately when we're asking that 550 pound steer to gain, we're asking that steer to put on muscle. That is our end product, muscle, the meat that we are going to eat. And so if that 550 pound steer is getting um, 800 grams of crude protein, it can gain close to two pounds a day. However, if that steer is at initial feedlot entry and or that steer is sick or there's something else going on, uh, it's getting bullied at the bunk and that steer can't eat but 1% a day, then that steer is not going to gain. That steer needs a minimum of 450 grams of crude protein in order to gain 0.4 pounds a day. And I think we would all be pretty broke feedlot managers if our steers only gain 0.4 pounds a day. Um, that's not a very good average daily gain. 
And so when we think about this protein um, at, in that hierarchy for growth, then we can start to put some numbers around this and, and think about how that intake is driving everything else that we are doing in the, in the system. So that's the take home. Nutrition is about consumption, not concentration. Now for the rest of this talk, I'm gonna stop harping on that. And I'm gonna focus on the fact, uh, I'm gonna focus on different rations that we're using and um, assume that all of these steers have passed that 21 days in our eating uh, for ad libitum intake, eating 2% um, of their body weight at least. Now, I have this little book that I keep on my desk next to me pretty much every day of my life, not just because I'm a nerd, but because I'm a nutrition nerd. And this book is the Beef Cattle NRC. And in this book, um, we have detailed out in specific tables, uh, thanks to the great work of Lofgreen and Garrett back in the 1960s out in California, where they did comparative slaughter techniques, they've detailed the requirements of cattle um, at different stages of production. So in these four to six weight calves, um, we're focused on um, their needs relative to a two, two and a half percent intake. And what I want to point out to you is that this 16% crude protein in these lighter weight steers is necessary because of their size and how little they are consuming. Um, they need uh, that much crude protein in order to meet their uh, crude protein requirements of, for, for the rapid growth that they are experiencing during that time. As those steers get larger, we can uh, begin to increase the energy intake a little bit more because they're going to consume a little bit more less feed so we have to increase the energy density of that feed uh, relative to their body weight as a percent of their body weight. And, and so we increase the, the energy composition of that diet, but we can decrease the protein because the, the grams per day protein uh, requirement is still met. So here are the ration scenarios that we're going to walk through for those animals. And I'm going to focus um, 600 pounds and beyond because I think bringing in four weight cattle is a fairly unique experience. Most of our cattle from Virginia through the Northeast um, will wean closer to 600 pounds. Um, and so if you have four weight cattle, feel, re feel, feel free to reach out to me. They're a great... Um, they're a great opportunity to maximize average daily gain early in the feedlot because of their small size. They have very rapid weight gain um, and very efficient weight gain, but there are some challenges there and some eccentricities because of the, the little intake that they have relative, um, uh, relative to their counterparts. So in these uh, next slides, I'm going to present four scenarios. Um, these are scenarios that I have come across commonly in my last five years as an extension educator in the Northeast, and these scenarios I hope will, will resonate with um, you all as well. So ration one, or ration scenario number one, if you prefer, is a free choice hay scenario. So this would be where we've got feeder cattle in a pen, we've maybe got a round bale feeder, uh, in the pen with them and we're supplementing alongside grain. Studies have shown that when we do this, cattle will choose to consume about 30% of their daily dry matter intake or DMI as hay and um, the other 70% they will consume as grain. So for calculation purposes, um, that's what I've depicted in the next several slides is 30% forage in the ration but know that that resonates with a free choice hay ration. Scenario number two, hay is mixed into the TMR and is limited. Uh, in this scenario, um, I always say I may be a little bit arrogant. I didn't go to school for 10 years to think that cattle have the right to choose what they eat when I've studied for 10 years what they should eat at this point, 20 years, I'm getting a little old. Um, and so we limit the hay intake and uh, feed the cattle a TMR, much like a, a dairy type of a situation. Now, this case in, in scenario number two, we're still using hay 
In scenario number three, we switch out that hay. I don't know um, how many of you are hay farmers in New York, but I told all my hay farmers here in Pennsylvania this year, uh, sell your hay to the horse people and, and find some corn silage or some baleage to feed to your cattle because our market for hay uh, was that strong uh, this year. And we have a lot of horse people in Pennsylvania that are willing to pay top dollar for good quality hay that our beef farmers make. So um, scenario number three takes corn silage then um, and fed at 40% of the diet dry matter. And scenario number four um, drops that corn silage down to 20% of the diet dry matter, which closely matches the roughage concentration then provided by the 10% hay in scenario number two, because we know that most of our corn silage, um, our better corn silage anyways, about 50% corn grain and 50% roughage. So the other items uh, in these diets, corn and soybeans make up most of the differentials then between the diets. And so it, it's mainly corn that we're altering in order to adjust um, the energy density and the forage inclusion in those diets. Uh, but the diets are formulated to meet the animal's needs at each particular stage. So here is our six to eight weight group. In this case, uh, um, our six to eight weight group is fed diet one at about 58% corn grain, 9% soybeans, and, and again, that 30% orchard grass. So I'm not gonna go through this. This is just to show you the makeup of those four different diets um, that we just walked through in the text slide so that you can see the differentials then um, in corn and beans between those diets. The soybeans are less in the hay diets because we were using a fairly uh, decent quality of hay like we produce in the Northeast, and that brings in a fair amount of protein in it, whereas that corn silage is very light on protein and we have to make up the protein difference with soybeans. So in our eight to, to 14 weight uh, or eight to finish weight animals, um, the difference here is simply that those animals are consuming more, but have a similar grams per day requirement for protein. And so we can drop the soybeans in that diet down um, just a little bit because those animals are, are able to eat more pounds per day. Thus the, the concentration of protein can, can decrease. So when we think about how these diets will affect the performance of those animals, the average daily gain is across the top of this slide. Those animals that are allowed to consume, and, and for this, for the sake of time, because I only have seven minutes left, um, I took those animals all the way from 600 pounds to 1400 pounds um, on their performance predictions in one slide, just so we could, we could ease it down. So those animals that are allowed to consume 30% of their ration as hay will only be able to gain 2.7 pounds per day. This is because that hay is limiting their physical ability to consume and the energy and is limiting the energy density of the diet. So these animals have a less energy dense diet. They're gaining less um, uh, weight and so they are, are the least efficient. This is a feed conversion ratio, a feed to gain ratio. So how many pounds of feed does it take to put on one pound of gain? It takes seven pounds of feed in diet one, 7.2 pounds of feed to put on one pound of average daily gain. Now, um, I was teaching a class, Livestock Feeds and Feeding today, and, and I was teaching beef nutrition to a group of students that had already studied aquaculture, poultry, um, and, and swine uh, feeding. And I said, this is our, our greatest disadvantage in the beef industry. When, when we're simply stacked up next to other uh, meat producing sectors, our feed conversions are, are by far the worst. Um, when we're stacked up against those sectors pound for pound. However, our greatest advantage is, and this is a, a prime scenario, those animals are consuming hay, those animals are consuming corn silage, and in many cases, those animals are consuming byproducts that no other industry sector can use, aquaculture, poultry, or swine. And so that is our biggest advantage um, when we talk about cattle. Now, if you look at the rest of these diets, you can see how that average daily gain uh, changes very little 
uh, because of the nutrient density in those diets and um, being somewhat similar. However, there are modest changes that impact the days on feed, but remember that diet two and diet four were our most similar roughage concentrations and had our least amount of roughage. And these cattle in, um, fed 10% hay inclusion or 20% corn silage um, are only on feed for about 270 days um, versus 278 or 300 days for the, the diet three and one respectively. Now I have, oh, this was supposed to, to fly in. Um, I have pricing here, but I wanna point out something. Um, this pricing isn't very relevant to today's market. I just am using it to show you pricing comparisons among the five diets based on performance. This is a five-year pricing average um, where corn silage is priced or valued at about nine times the cost of corn per bushel uh, per the Iowa Ag Guide guidelines. Um, again, these prices are five-year averages, and I used five-year averages as a comparison initially uh, because we have not been anywhere close to averages um, for a while and, and, and won't be in the near future. So I'll talk about that in a moment. When we look at the economic predictions for this group of animals uh, based on those five-year feed cost averages, I'm just gonna um, draw your attention to the bottom line here, which is our profit and loss. Um, you, can, you can look over the numbers at your leisure and, and look at the sale prices and those kinds of things. We use kind of current sale price economics, but what is really relevant is the profit and loss. How much are these animals uh, making or losing? Those animals fed diet three are actually the most profitable animals. Despite their eight additional days on feed, corn silage is our most economically um, viable option in many cases when it comes to, to uh, feeding cattle, particularly in the Northeast with our corn basis. And so um, we can see that those cattle that were fed in diet three in this particular scenario uh, yielded the best economic return. But those cattle that were fed in uh, diet four were not far behind. Um, in many cases, I think the average daily gain predictions, or in this case, I think the average daily gain prediction might be a little bit light for diet four. And I anticipate those cattle um, given implants and other technologies may have responded even better. Um, so there's a differential here of about 12 bucks a head. Now, despite the fact that the cattle fed diet two gained similarly, performed similarly to those cattle fed diet number four, the expense of hay um, makes diet two uh, an option that becomes less desirable economically because uh, that hay is a valuable commodity. And even when we limit that hay inclusion, um, we still come out dollars ahead to feed a product that other industries can't use. Now, I told you those were five-year averages. I priced these prices out in February um, and they've, they've changed even a little bit more since then with current hay prices in Pennsylvania and current corn prices. And given the current hay shortage in Pennsylvania and the current cost per bushel of corn and grain, um, diet one and two quickly become losses. So we are no longer making any money on these cattle. We are losing money on these cattle because of how much it costs us to feed those animals. Our profit and loss um, looks a little upset then for uh, diet three and four, we're still coming out dollars ahead, um, but we're not nearly as favorable as we were with that five-year uh, average pricing scheme. Again, we have to keep in mind that those feed inputs that we're talking about are accounting for 60 to 75 percent of our total operating costs, and those are really driving our bottom line. If we look at these profit margins over the last five years, um, that's not totally unheard of. Um, the nationwide, the beef cattle industry is often operating in margins around that $100 to $150 a head. Now in the Northeast, we tend to do a little bit better than that because we take opportunities um, to, to target niche markets or local markets, uh, and we're getting very good at that. And so we can change those margins a little bit. But again, 
nationwide, um, if contracted, margins are only at about $144. And of course, COVID shoots all of this right in the foot because you can see um, there are times when our, our steer price um, was, was terrible during COVID and times when, when we didn't even have access to a packer in order to get uh, a price for that finished animal. Why? Well, of course, obviously, there were the labor concerns um, and the labor shortages as, as the virus moved into some of our larger packing plants. But there were also consumer concerns that were causing these challenges. Consumers at the start of the pandemic were uh, really focused on uh, the fact that they, they did not feel food secure. When people do not feel food secure, their buying habits change. We saw grocery runs. We saw um, there was weeks in state college when ground beef was being sold for seven or eight dollars a pound. Ground beef um, early in the pandemic because of, of the shortage of what was available there as more and more people tried to fill their freezers uh, in fear for what there might be uh, later on. In addition to this, um, consumers turn towards the farmers uh, to satisfy their needs for the, the meat that they weren't finding in the grocery stores. And this put a burden on the farmers, particularly a burden in terms of uh, being able to get enough cattle to the butcher and finding a butcher that could process those cattle fast enough to meet those consumer demands. And I, I know I'm, a, I'm two minutes over, and so I'm just going to end with when we talk about um, getting our cattle to market, one thing we absolutely have to figure out is we have to be able to judge those cattle's readiness for market. This is a calf with nice finish, so it's going to, it's well marbled. It's not going to get any kind of uh, cold shortening or anything in the, the cooler because it's got this nice cover on it. When we push cattle too fast that don't have a good fat cover on them, we really suffer the detriment, whether we're selling those cattle direct to the consumer or whether we're selling them on a contract. There are certain specs that we have to meet. And the only way to make sure that we do not uh, get caught is to learn what it is that we're looking for and then schedule, schedule, schedule to make sure that we have our slot in the market and then manage those cattle to make sure that we, we get them there on time. So I think um, every time I start a farm profit meeting, I always start with what are your goals? You have to make a plan, you have to stick to the plan and you have to schedule. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Tara, I appreciate uh your time tonight and thanks for that great presentation. Uh, are you able to stick around for a little bit? Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat box currently, uh, but uh, hopefully you can stay on uh, to the end of the evening's program with us. Uh, Absolutely. Wonderful, Absolutely. thank you so much. Okay, uh, so once again, I'll remind you folks, uh, when questions arise in your head and you wanna get them out, uh, you don't have to wait for an opportune time to ask them. Put them in the chat box and we'll be happy to address them as they come in. Uh, we'll keep moving on with tonight's agenda. Our next speaker uh, will be introduced by my counterpart in Eastern New York, Ashley Pierce. Great, thank you so much. So we're really excited to have Mike Lappy here with us tonight. Um, one thing uh, he's gonna be speaking to us about is uh, He's going to be really focusing on the viewpoint of the consumer, the chef, the butcher or meat processor, the slaughter person, and the educator. Uh, his focal point has always been sourcing and utilizing local meats in a mindful way, while also generating minimal waste along the way. He'll be specifically speaking about choosing an appropriate breed um, and selecting them for your desired sale and management style, uh, understanding specific cuts that come from a carcass and utilizing that carcass to its maximum value uh, through understanding cooking methods, muscle composition, and added value applications. So uh, Mike is a visiting instructor of animal science at the State University of New York at Cobuskill. And yeah, we're just really excited to have him here today. So Mike, uh, I will turn it over to you. Nope, do we have you here, Mike? 
Mike, you're muted. Oh, sorry, sorry. Thank you Great. so much, Ashley. I'm, it's a wonderful uh, privilege to be here um, to speak with you guys this evening. What I want to do is I'm going to share my screen and um, go forward from there. Okay. All right, so everyone hears me well? Yes, it's good now, Mike. Okay. So I wanna talk a little bit about my history um, and how I became um, to do what I do today. So I went to school for um, commercial art. I have art background and I ended up working in restaurants. And through restaurants, I ended up working my way through restaurants and then ended up um, owning my own restaurant. And at that point, when I owned my own restaurant, I had farmers start coming to me and offering um, meat. And I, and I had to take them up on their offer and ended up using 90% of the menu that I was producing that would change weekly was directly from local farms. So at that point, I really needed to learn how to use a whole carcass and utilize the whole carcass and make a profit from it. So I started working with local farmers. I taught myself how to cut meat. I taught myself how to use the entire carcass in a mindful uh, economic way. We stayed in a business you know, for six years until the economy crashed. And at that point, I moved on, did carpentry and some other things for a while and ended up working with the Chefs Consortium, which is a group of uh, like-minded individuals that are all focused on local food education. I ended up working at SUNY Cobble School as, and being hired on as a culinary instructor. At that point, within three semesters, I was asked to teach the meat cutting classes because they knew I had a background in meat cutting, but I didn't have a, I didn't necessarily have a background in the production aspect of meat cutting. So I, immersed myself into the facility, learned the ins and outs of the facility and had an opportunity to, to start working in the slaughter floor. And that was four years ago. I've been at SUNY Coleskill for almost nine years. And now um, I had transitioned from a culinary instructor to now I teach all the slaughter classes and the meat processing classes and work with a wide range of students on a daily basis. So what I wanna do tonight is focus on what, what my perspective is from when I see the animal come live to me um, and some things that maybe we can talk about of some interactions between the animal, myself and the, and the, and the producer. So we all know, no matter what you're raising, there's different limitations on time. Um, grass finished is a little bit longer, a little more labor intensive. You need to have be set up for that um, and then grain finished. What I'm trying to say is both are equally, equally delicious. Beef is delicious. If it's finished right, that's the most important thing. So this is a farm that I'm very fond of. I've worked with for 20 years. Um, it's a strict grass finished operation. Um, they do Ballage in the winter and then grass throughout pasture and hay throughout the summer. Um, you can see they have about 300 head, beautiful cows. Um, but these are, this is a picture of some of their herd just a couple days ago. And you can see that they're all well conditioned animals. They're very, uh, you know, they're, they look really good on the hoof. And this is a, a picture of one of the steers that the farm supplied me with. So you can see. The steer is probably about 24 months old, a little, or, little older um, than a grain finished steer, but you can see this is what I'm looking for when I come to work in, on a Monday morning. So I'm looking for this nice straight back, um, nice curved brisket and you know the tail head to be slightly um, pronounced. But if I come to work, I know just by the outside looks of this animal that it's going to be a good carcass. And then here's another picture of another uh, animal, same farm, um, fully finished. So one thing 
I really want to stress this evening is human involvement in animal handling systems. There's nothing more uh, nerve wracking to me is coming to slaughter um, on a Monday morning and having an animal pacing out in the pens. I think um, animal, like these animals should all be handled uh, greatly before the slaughter process. That is something that I found that the farms that are handling their, handling their animals regularly, getting them used to holding systems, um, corrals, are the animals that aren't stressed out when they come to me. There's nothing worse than that experience of having an animal that's completely out of its element. And when it comes to me, it's, it's just berserk because it's never been in any kind of, you know, it, um, any kind of pen or holding system. So that's one thing for as a slaughterman that I really want to emphasize is that people should be able to deal, hold, you know, work with their animals closely, make sure they're used to transport, uh, holding systems, corrals. And then here's an, another picture. Um, so what I feel, you know, having these animals go through these systems, that last day, you know, when they come to me, you don't want that to be the day that they have stress. That's the last thing you're gonna want is to have your animal stressed out when it comes to me. And I understand that some animals are just genetically prone to have those stress tendencies, but for the most part, animals that have been, help, been handled greatly don't have that stress. So humane handling. Humane handling um, comes from the farm, transport, all the way to the stun till all through the process through you know the animals been on till it reaches the rail so you can see i put great emphasis and you know humane handling all the way through so <clears throat> if you think about it animal goes into the slaughterhouse initial ph is around 6.8, 7.3. Um, if there's a distress disturbance, that pH is not going to go down to that 5.4 to 5.8 at rigor mortis. That's going to affect muscle quality. The last thing a farmer wants is to have their animal um, dis disrupted by inferior muscle quality because it's not going to eat right. It's not going to look right. It's not going to present right. So by Using effective animal handling and um, stress reduction processes that you'll be able to have that animal come through and it will be a quick and easy process to have the animal stunned, bled, and then um, put on a rail. Seven to 10 days were, is pretty a good standard for acceptable uh, tenderness, desirable flavor, and a modest weight loss in the carcass. A lot of the people that I work with want their carcasses aged out longer. And I'm going to give a good example in a couple slides about someone that wants their carcasses aged out longer, but it's pretty, it's not appropriate that this carcass is aged out longer because of the lack of finish. And then muscle composition after that further aging, that 75% of water composition is going to just turn into dehydration and then um, a little more pronounced flavor. But all those enzymatic changes are going to be uh, through between that seven to, day, seven to 10 day period. So here's a couple of carcasses that I had in the cooler this week. So you can see on the right hand side, these are a Piedmontese Normandy cattle. They dressed out around 500 pounds. If you look over on the left hand the left hand slide, you can see that this animal is really lacking finish. The farmer also wants this animal hung an extended period of time. So you're going to have two things. You're going to have ox oxidized uh, in an oxidized exterior of the carcass. You don't have a lot of finish on the back where you really want it along the um, muscles of support. And then on the other hand, you can look at this carcass as well. And this, this is a Holstein heifer. 
This producer um, sells Holsteins primarily. And this is a contrast to of the other animal just because the yield on this animal is probably going to be in the 40% range, 45% range when it's all said and done. This animal, after uh, cutting mostly bone in cuts, ended up with several hundred pounds of fat. And you can see the fat deposits in this uh, visceral fat here that weighed probably 40 pounds almost on each side. So there's a big range like to have a cat, uh, cattle finished well, um, fed well, finished well through the, and through the correct time constraints and, um, and then having animals that are overfinished that you're not gonna have a good yield on or an animal that's gonna be underfinished. And these are two vast contrasting uh, images of either, either counterpart. So all, the, all cattle are made up of skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, and cardiac muscle. Primarily what we're gonna deal with today is skeletal muscle. And skeletal muscle runs throughout the animal and has different, uh, different size of fibers. So the larger fibers tend to be more toothsome and, have, and not as tender. The small fibers that run through the muscles of support are more tender. And as we go through, we'll talk more about that. So also, if you look at this cut here, you can see on the exterior, we have intermuscular fat. That's the fat that goes around the, the um, muscle. And then intramuscular, which is marbling. This is actual one a ribeye from the farm that I showed the finished carcass from. This is this farm I've worked with for 20 years. They do a really good job. I serve their meat in my restaurant. I'm really happy with their grass finished product. Um, and this is a really good example of a really well grass finished product. A lot of their animals don't finish out till 24 to 30 months, but this is the end result. And this is to me is quite a beautiful thing. So marbling is one of those attributes that most consumers want because what I want to do is detail from my perspective as a slaughter person all the way down to a consumer. So this is this is going to detail what we're looking at is kind of a roadmap of the carcass and an introductory roadmap of the carcass. So muscles of locomotion are all highlighted in yellow. These muscles of locomotion are all muscles that are hardworking muscles with a dense matrix of collagen and um, muscle. The muscles are dense and hardworking. All, all quadrupeds have those. That front shoulder is going to be a longer cooking muscle than anything that comes out of these muscles of support that range through the back. So all the muscles in the loin, all the way down to the round are muscles of support, which those muscles of support are the main muscles, the muscles you're gonna get money from. And, those, and that's where you're really gonna to want to finish on the outside of your animal. Um, and also, and then you have the round, which is also a muscle of locomotion, but you can, it's a lean muscle of locomotion. You can do other things. And once we get into the cut sheet that I have, We'll talk more about that as well. And flank and the short plate, which the short plate you can look at as a pretty versatile cut, um, taking short ribs. But in the summer months, we'll talk about, you know, treating that differently, cutting the plate differently for different applications. All right, so here's the basic uh, premise of what I see on a daily basis. So animals come in, they have a carcass tag, we have a cut sheet. The cut sheet is where the producer and the processor should engage. The processor and the uh, producer should be able to have a good conversation and walk the 
the person that's raising the animal through a cut sheet and give them some points on the positive attributes or the negative attributes of their carcass and help them figure out what suits their carcass the best. Um, as we go through it. And then I have another, I'm gonna. So, so this is our cut sheet at SUNY Cobble Skills. So you can see we have thickness of stakes. Standard is a one and a quarter inch stake, which to me, one and, inch, one and a quarter inches is a perfect uh, thickness for cooking. So I think about cooking a lot when I'm cutting meat and that one and a quarter inches is perfectly for grilling, searing, um, finishing the cut with minimal time, but still having a really good end result. Most people go with that. Um, and then uh, we also have a desired fat trim. So what I've found through history over the last five years is that the people that want the fat don't have the fat on their carcass. And the people that don't want fat have too much fat on their carcass. Um, and what I tend to do is I try to go through the, car the cut sheets with um, the producer, go through each you know, area, talk about what kind of cuts, what kind of seasonal cuts they want to do, what, what they want to get out of their carcass. Um, so here are the main primals on a beef carcass. So we have our chuck with the subprimal of our arm. We'll go back to the rib. So the rib is where your rib eyes, um, rib, rib roast, all your rib steaks come from. You could, you know, tomahawk steaks. And then your, your short loin is where your, your loin or strip loins or your tenderloins are gonna come from. And then your top sirloin. And I'm gonna, when we go through this, we'll talk more about the specific cuts as we go through. Your round is your hind leg, your flank, your plate, and your brisket, your brisket and foreshank. So what, what happens when your carcass comes to us? Carcass comes into the room, we break the carcass, um, we create primal cuts, which I just went through the primal cuts down to subprimals, to retail cuts, such as steaks and roasts, and then packaging, and then back to the, the farm, the producer. So our four quarter of beef contains our rib, our chuck, our brisket, plate, and four shank. The square cut chuck is gonna be our first subprimal of our four quarter or and what it can includes is our shoulder clod our neck and our chuck roll so you can see these are some rough cuts of a square cut chuck so that whole chuck primal has your neck your arm clod and your chuck roll but right here is your square cut chuck and what you can do with that is the old fashioned way, which you're gonna, you can make a seven bone steak or a seven bone roast, or one of those uh, traditional chuck arm pot roasts. And, or pull some of those chuck short ribs off the, the plate on the, um, the chuck itself. And then if you wanna get further into this, so I have a lot of producers that they'll raise bigger animals and they want, more value from that animal. So that's when we go to the point where we can break that animal down further into smaller cuts. So they're not, there's not a big uh, sticker shock when it comes to market. So you look at over here and you can see your whole chuck roll. And then I have the option of making roasts out of my chuck roll or chuck eye steaks, which are quite delicious. I also have the option of removing the underblade or your serratus ventralis, and I can make Denver steaks from that, which you don't see very often in market, but it's one of those things that you're, you're starting to see in some butcher shops and grocery stores. So being able to separate those two muscles out is adding to the value by kind of decreasing the size of the cuts that you're selling, selling more 
and getting more value. So some, pro some primals of that chalk would be Mary Lynn, do you want me to take a stab at a couple of these questions while we wait for Michael to come back on? Or Ashley? Yeah, yeah, Tara, I'm not sure where, um, what happened. Hopefully he'll come back, but yes, that would be great. Thank you. So in the chat, we have a couple of questions about grain versus grass fed beef. Um, this has been a topic, a hot topic recently about the health benefits. And if you watch um, social media, there's a lot of of popular press articles that have been published kind of touting the benefits of, of grass-fed beef. However, if you dig into the scientific literature, um, the omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acid differences that are touted um, in grass-fed beef actually exist in the same concentration um, in grain-fed beef. There's just less fat in general though in grass-fed beef. And so it really depends on what your, your market desires. Um, the pictures that Mike showed of, of that really well-marbled grass-fed beef um, was achieved as he said they were feeding baleage. So um, it, it is achievable, but is, is less likely in a grazing, uh, grazing situation. Um, in terms of taste, um, again, that's largely driven by that, that fat uh, composition. And um, some of those taste differentials uh, are consumer by consumer driven. In the scientific research and in, in large um, blinded taste panels, there's typically not a detectable difference in a trained panel uh, between um, grass-fed and grain finished beef of a similar finish. And that's an important point. Sorry, Michael, I was just answering questions while we waited for yeah, you to get I'm back sorry, I, I normally don't lose connection here. All right, so let me go back to where I was. All right, so can everyone hear me still? Yes, my All right, so infraspinatus, it's, it's in the center of the chuck. It's rated the second most tender muscle on the animal. That's something I'm seeing more from producers asking for. Um, and we go down. And then one thing I'm really disappointed with is the amount of producers that aren't taking back things like soup bones. So I had a student one time and he has great, he's having great success at a farmer's market. And I asked him, so do you guys, you guys make stock, you have a 20 C? And he's like, no, I never really thought about it. And I said, you should, you should probably think about making stock and trying to sell it by the court. And he got approval from Ag and Markets, made a batch of stock, and then ended up coming home with $600 that weekend extra. And I, and I try to influence as many producers as possible to use, you know, to fully utilize their animals to their, to their full capabilities. But it's really kind of, uh, it makes, it's unhappy. I, I'm, I'm happy to see a lot of the people that are producing animals aren't taking a lot of the stuff back that they're actually sending in. And it just will go, it goes into the rendering barrel in the end of the day. Um, so the other part of that chuck is your shoulder or your arm clod. And 
there's a and rather than grinding it there's a bunch of cuts that you can actually produce from this uh shoulder clod which is your terrace major or your bistro tender which is a really really um really tender cut that comes out of the shoulder clod or some or the ranch steaks that are on the right side so rather than grinding the shoulder clod that could make beautiful roasts um and make a little more profit you can actually turn it into cuts so now we come to the rib primal so that rib primal is one of the main muscles of support um it's what you'll see for you'll see prime rib made out of uh tomahawk steaks ribeye steaks or your delmonico steak so the main muscle is the longissimus and the spinalis dorsi is the cap muscle. Um, so there's two different muscles within that, in that primal, which can be utilized well. So when I had my restaurant, if I had a big rib, I could actually remove the longissimus and then take the uh, spinalis off and turn that into a whole nother appetizer or another dish in itself, which would allow me if I had a really big rib to make smaller, thicker cuts that were that cooked better and in in my eye and like it was definitely more of an economical um pathway to choose with that rib so here are some of the cuts from the uh seven bone rib primal so we have your rib steak your rib roast um a, a french rib steak and then your spinalis dorsi with that cap muscle that you can see distinctly here on the left. And then you can also pull your back ribs from the from a boneless rib steak, and those can be sold as well. Um, the plate. So the plate is the primal that's right below the rib. And there's a lot of options, especially in these warmer months. A lot of people are saying, what do I want short ribs for? That's a slow brazing cut takes a lot of time, um, but there's other options such as these cross cut short ribs that are three quarters in thickness. And what's pretty cool about the short rib plate is that those can be grilled. They can be quickly marinated and then grilled quickly. And they seem to sell really well. Um, and a lot of producers that have taken them back have a lot of, had a great success with them. Another cut over here is the hanger steak, which that's the, the one of the main muscles that controls your diaphragm and people tend to call it the butcher's tenderloin because there's only one on the carcass. And not a lot of people take those, take them back, but it's a delicious cut. Um, the farm that I frequently work with has those, you know, they slaughter several cows every two weeks, they stockpile them and then they'll sell them off to a restaurant every month or so. And then also, your skirt steak is part of your plate, which is a really thick grain muscle, but a lot of those thick grain muscles have tendency to have more flavor. So you think about flavor versus tech, uh, texture, and often I go with flavor over texture. So Here's something that people really don't utilize that often is the beef navel. So you don't see it on cut sheets, but I know a lot of um, chefs and like farm producers that are making beef bacon. So beef bacon, the original pastrami was the beef navel. Um, and normally it just goes in the ground. And you can think about if say people don't wanna eat pork, you could actually produce beef bacon that would resemble the, if you look at it closely, you can see that it would resemble the same thing as what a bacon would be on pork, but it's, it's beef. And then your inside skirt, which is another, basically the, almost the same shape and texture as your outer skirt, but it's lays within the diaphragm or the, the navel. So the brisket, that is the primal that is up in the uh, sternum of the animal, which is separated by, you could have your full brisket, your brisket flat and your brisket point. So this cut 
typically is something that you'd see around uh, St. Patrick's Day for corned beef, or the point would be utilized in a lot of barbecue restaurants. Um, both slow and low, muscles of locomotion take a lot of time to break down through hydrolysis. Um, and within the four, in the four quarter, we have our four shank. So the four shank um, is a delicious, delicious, slow cooking uh, cut that a lot of people refer to it as asabuco. Um, and a lot of people don't really utilize these. And you can look at them and see that they have all these strips of collagen that are running through them. That collagen through uh, slow and low cooking times really breaks down and becomes soft. And that's what makes the stew meat softer. Um, I'd never recommend doing, I try not to recommend people taking stew meat out of the hind quarter. But, and then you also have marrow bones, which um, those are great for pets. And they're also a lot of chefs will love to have those as well. So we move into the hind quarter. Um, you can see that our primals in our hind quarter would be our round, our top sirloin, our short loin, and our flank. And that's the fore quarter and hind quarter are separated from your 13th ribs, your 13th rib. And some of examples of subprimals out of our hind quarter be our hind shank, bottom round, top round, eye round, our sirloin tip, our flank steak, our tenderloin and our loin because our tenderloin and our loin make up our porterhouse and T-bones. So you can see here, this is your short loin primal and the top, you'll see that your psoas major is your tenderloin and then on the bottom is your longissimus, that same longissimus that runs all the way through your rib section. So with that, you can make your T-bones and porterhouse steaks. And then if you look at it this way, you can actually pull off your full tenderloin for a full tenderloin roast or have a bone in strip that can be um, cut into steaks as well. And then the transition from the boneless strip to a loin roast to a strip steak. And then you can do petite strip steaks from that point on but you can see that starting from that loin primal, there's a lot of possibilities that you can go with. And then your tenderloin, you can see that you have a full tenderloin up on the top left and you can see your center tenderloin here with your butt and then fillets as well. And that tenderloin can be making and turned into roast or fillets all the way through. I'm not a big fan of tenderloin just because it is the most tender muscle on the animal, but it lacks in flavor. And then this is my actual, my favorite primal out of the entire animal. The top sirloin is wonderful. And there's so many possibilities within this top sirloin. And it's, it's a pretty vast primal, um, which lends it to being a very large steak when you're just cutting it into normal steaks. So there's a lot of different options you can go with with this top sirloin. So this is, for instance, is some cuts that we made last week. On the right-hand side, we made some large sirloin steaks. On the left-hand side, you can see that I broke this um, top sirloin out into four equal roasts. So one customer wanted steaks, the other customer wanted roasts, and you're able to break this top sirloin out by taking your cap off, which your culotte would be your cap, your tri-tip, would come off your bottom sirloin. And then you can take your gluteus medius or your center sirloin and split it directly in half to have two, two roasts of the same size. So basically that top sirloin broke into four equal roasts if you're thinking about sharing a carcass four ways. Or you want smaller roasts to sell out of that top sirloin. A lot of times a butcher would actually probably grind the, the tri-tip or the cap if they were making roasts out of their uh, top sirloin, that butcher might actually cut them horizontally, which would be a sin to have a roast that would be cut horizontally for cooking methods. Because we all know that 
the grain is running 90 degrees through the muscle and to act to make it tender or more tender, you're gonna to wanna to cut it at a 90 degree angle to go against the grain. And you can see over here that these top sirloins have that cap still in them. And I made a couple smaller cap steaks as well. So the top sirloin can be broken down into your tri-tip or your culotte. This is your culotte for the, or the cap. Tri-tip was featured on the last slide. And then you can see that whole sirloin steak that has the culotte attached. And then your other option would be to break down your gluteus medius and have a center sirloin roast and center sirloin steaks. And this is your tri-tip. Um, tri-tip is something you don't really see that often in uh, on the East Coast, but on the West Coast, the tri-tip is revered as one of these cuts that they have competitions for it's 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 got a really big following on the west coast you're starting to see it more in grocery stores now but um it's something that i see customers asking producers asking for a lot more now especially for farmers markets and the round the round is that entire hind leg and so our top round or our inside round has a lot of possibilities because you think about it the full top round steak could weigh up to four pounds. It's rare that you're gonna to go to a market or sell retail that people are gonna to wanna to really invest in a four pound steak, especially not knowing if it was maybe their first time trying your product. So I, what I tend to do is seam the top round out. I use the gracilis muscle or your cap muscle as a separate muscle and that can turn into an alternative for almost like a flank steak. And then once you're seeing, you can seam out the two center muscles in the top round and make petite top round steaks, which I found that most of the customers that I'm working with, most of the producers I'm working with, I have really good luck with selling the smaller top round steaks because they can be cut a little bit thicker, um, cooked to a perfect medium rare and then sliced against the grain rather than having those a big giant London broil style top round. So there's a lot of, rather than grounding, grinding that top round, there's a lot of advantages to cutting it smaller. And the top round would also make great kebabs. So the, that's that lean muscle of locomotion from the hindquarter would make really good kebabs as well. Eye round, eye round is synonymous for not eating well, makes a great roast beef. Um, or sandwich steaks. A lot of people will take eye round steaks, which I, I don't feel the eye round steaks is the best way the, to use an eye round. I think the eye round suits itself better for a roast or something cut thin like a sandwich steak. And then your bottom round. Bottom round makes really, really excellent roast beef um, or cube steaks or sandwich steaks. It can also be turned into kebabs as well. Um, so it's a lean muscle of locomotion, tends to not do well through long cooking processes. And it does really well at temperatures, a little bit below 140 for a perfect medium rare uh, roast beef. And then your sirloin tip. It's a very distinctive muscle within the round um, you can tell there's a little bit of sinew, a band of sinew that runs through it. Uh, sirloin tip steaks are really delicious. And you can also seam this whole sirloin tip out to make two equal roasts. So each roast on a, uh, say, 10 pound uh, sirloin tip, you could make equal, equal two five pound roasts out of that or even smaller if you quartered it. But makes really good roasts, kebabs. Um, or steaks. And then that hind shank, that cross cut shank. Um, and then your heel as well is, is an extension of your, uh, your hind shank. And you also find that that heel, one of the most tender muscles in the animal dwells in that heel, which they will call it your Merlot cut. Um, a lot of people think of that heel as something that's only good for ground but there's also cuts you can pull from that, that heel as well, 
which that's the extension of your hind shank. You can see here in this middle picture, all that collagen that's in that shank, which all breaks down through hydrolysis and turns into gelatin and makes a gelatinous, like unctuous, uh, soft stew meat. So here's really one of my focal points as an instructor. I want customers to take as much offal back as they possibly can. I want people to, sh to be rejuvenated and eating the entire animal. I think that throughout history, we've really gone off the right path and people don't look at eating, consuming an entire animal. Um, over on the left, you have your sweetbreads. So that thymus gland you find in younger cattle. This is a delicacy that you'll find in fine dining restaurants all over the world. I have a, I have a long history of sweetbreads. I've, I've cooked them in my entire career. Um, people, people love them when they have a chance to try them. I love being able to have a student um, on the slaughter floor harvesting harvest sweetbreads and then go into um, a kitchen and actually cook those and have the, their, their overwhelming joy that, that, that they can experience from trying something that they would have never thought of being a, an edible item. Um, beef tongues, those things that people never want back, but it's delicious. Um, takes a little bit of preparation to prepare it, but it's so it's it's delicious. Um, also, you can see your hanger steak on the right with your cheek meat. I don't know how many people actually have their have their cheeks uh, reserved off the, from the slaughter process. That's another thing is each carcass has roughly three pounds, three to four pounds of cheek meat on the on the on the head. Um, which is really delicious. And also oxtails. Oxtails are another really delicious part of the animal that people aren't utilizing. And another topic that I really wanted to cover is older animals. Older animals to me make some of the best eating experiences. This is a seven year old rib steak from a grass finished animal um, that I had the opportunity to purchase. I find that there's a lot of misconceptions about older animals. People tend not to want to eat them, but they are equally delicious, especially if they're maintained on a, on a, a, a good diet. So a lot of people, I'm just thinking outside of the box and um, I've served nine year old uh, cold cows to 90 plus people and they were amazed of how well it tasted and how tender it still was. So we'll get to cooking. Um, so grilling, roasting, pan frying, searing or smoking. My artery reaction, my, my artery reaction is that um, reaction to heat to the muscle, um, invoking the sugars within the, the protein, the sugars are caramelizing, creating flavor. And that I get back to when I talk about cooking, cutting for thickness for that my artery reaction, proper my artery reaction to have a muscle that is still medium rare, medium-ish, but has a, it's, ex, extensive color on the exterior because that color is where you get your flavor from. And that Maillard reaction is what makes the, the actual cut taste good. So you get people that want their cut, they, they're trying to think uh, economically and they want all their cuts at three quarters of an inch. Well, I hate to say it, but you take a three quarter inch steak put it in a pan and cook it, you're going to have a well done steak and the exterior is going to be gray and it won't be pleasing. If you think in terms of eating with meat, and that's the way you should be thinking in terms in meat, you're going to be able to think thickness, time and cooking. If you can correlate everything from the animal from um, carcass finish to 
the way it's cut into cooking, that's where you're gonna get the best results. And then slow and low, which we would talk about braising, smoking, stew, stewed meat or sous vide. Um, so denaturing the uh, collagen within that muscle, muscles breaking down through hydrolysis, creating a very soft, um, delicious textured meat. That's kind of why I don't recommend um, processors, you know, going for making stew meat out of the round. That stew meat out of the round is never going to be as tender as something that would come out of your forequarter or your chuck. Um, so thank you. Um, feel free to reach out to me at uh, my email or on Instagram at any point. So these are some pictures of some dishes some uh, that I have up as well. So we do have a few questions, Mike. Um, okay. One was just, was it hard to teach yourself butchering? Teach myself? No, not really at, for myself. Um, once you learn the carcass, and I really kind of like, it's, it's a, it was a great experience to learn the carcass and the way that I learned the carcass because I taught myself a way to cut meat in a, in a way that I could serve a farm's meat without attaching a, a specific cup. So I learned how to break down muscles in a way that I could serve a whole muscle and slice it against the grain and every diner would get an equal um, portion of that meat. So there would, it would, I, I taught myself in that way, but no, once you learn one carcass, you know, every carcass. So if you learn how to cut rabbits, beef is going to come instinctively. You're working your way up through it. So what I, what I recommend is starting off with things like lamb and working your way up from there. Um, but no, once you learn your learn muscle memory and every bone structure and muscle structure is the same in every carcass that you're breaking down. Great, thank you. Um, one person wrote, my, uh, my short ribs seem like there is no meat on them. Is that normal? Well, carcass finish has a lot to do with it. And it also has a lot to do with the, um, the packer or the processor not evaluating what he's sending back. There's a lot to say for knowing how to cook something. Me as a processor, I understand muscle and I understand what is going to be good. But yes, like a lot of times it, it goes into how much finishes on the animal or, or the you know, size of the short rib. But there, there's ways of getting around that by only picking out the, the ribs that have the substantial meat on them. Great, thank you. Another question is, where does the flat iron steak come from? The flat iron comes from your chuck. It comes, it's your infraspinatus. It comes from the shoulder blade. Um, it's rated the second most tender muscle on the carcass. It's um, very easy to pull. It's a little harder to um, fabricate because there's a very th thick uh, membrane of thick sinew that goes right down the center of it, which it takes a lot of skill to be able to remove that effectively. And we have, oh, let me pull the questions back up. Um, this is a little off top or is off topic of beef, but hopefully you can, uh, don't mind answering. Yeah. What is the difference between mutton and lamb? Is it only the age of the sheep? Yeah, anything over a year old with lamb would be considered mutton. It will be labeled mutton anything over a year. That's one of my, um, one of the things that I take great pride in is that I really try to educate people on using older animals in every species. Um, I have a lot of lamb producers that I've become very close with and um, kind of created an added value um, system with a lot of these lamb producers that what we do is we take a lot of their call sheep and we turn them into a variety of sausages. And these, these have really exploded at farmer's market. Even though they're considered mutton, 
um, they've sold really well and the customers want more and more. And they're always, always want to send their older sheep in to have them turn into sausage. Also, one of my, one of my best lamb producers takes, sends a lot of her older sheep in and we do, we use all the middle meat out of those sheep and that this sells really well as well. I really, I really want to advocate for using older animals well-finished older animals and i think they're they're really delicious and i think those are all the questions i see in the chat box so does anyone have any other questions for either of our speakers all right mary lynn are you are you with us i can turn it back over to you yep i'm still oh, here um, with you yep i do actually have yep. one last question in the chat box um and Sandy, you might have to uh, help me clarify your question. So how to guarantee marble, oh, just marbling, I'm sorry. How to guarantee marbling? And there might be a question for both of you for maybe our nutritionist. There are no guarantees in life. Um, so I always joke, Sandy, that I can, you can give me the best, new, the, the best genetics and I can screw it up nutritionally or you can give me the worst genetics and I can really make them look good with a, a decent nutrition program. And, but, but it really is, uh, if you want to guarantee success, if you really want to, to do everything that you can, there's again, no guarantee, but if you wanna do everything you can to ensure marbling, it really is a marriage of, of nutrition management and genetics. Michael talked about um, animal stress and animal handling and, and stress can be a huge detriment to uh, an, an animal's ability to marble. Um, it's, it's maybe a little bit of a hokey example, but when you see those pictures of Japanese cattle getting massaged daily and those kinds of things, one of the reasons that those practices came about is because um, that culture recognized the importance of a low stress environment for those animals to, to marble in. And you see it every time you send a, a large lot of cattle to, um, to, a, to a, a big slaughterhouse like JBS. Um, when I send my research cattle, inevitably the one that tried to chase me down in the pen and kill me is the one that's gonna grade dark and yeah. with very little marbling. And our last question might be for both speakers. Um, Angus versus other breeds for quality of product. I'm a big supporter of hybrid vigor, like for sure. The, you know, crossing different breeds. Um, a lot of times, like I'll give my personal opinion on Angus. Um, as a slaughterman, when I pull up to the pens in the morning and I walk out to see an Angus out there, most likely that cow is going to be the one that's circling in the pen and is going to be the hardest to deal with. Again, I think this really comes back to genetic lines. Um, there are a lot of really good Angus genetics out there where you can have uh, uh, amazing cattle. Um, there are also a lot of really good Simmental genetics out there that that uh, will yield an amazing quality meat product. Um, and also consequently grade certified Angus beef simply because they are also black hided. And when you get to the packing plant, nobody knows what the pedigree is. And so the certified Angus beef label is based off of degree of marbling and color of the hide predominantly. And so um, it, the, the, um, there are really good Hereford lines that will marble exceptionally well as well and, and have a quality eating experience. I will say the certified Angus brand is, is one of the largest nonprofit organizations in the United States and has done a phenomenal job for the Angus breed marketing that product. And I would argue that um, in their role as a promotion nonprofit, they've done a phenomenal job for beef because you ask any Joe Schmo on the street and they know what certified Angus beef is. Um, they might not eat a lot of beef, but they know when they want quality um, that, that certified Angus means quality. But again, it's important for us as producers to recognize um, economics. 
if it's going to take us an additional $100 to get a prime carcass out of that black hided animal, um, then that's not going to pay us the premium. The certified Angus beef premium right now is about 20 bucks a head if you're selling in a conventional market. Um, and whereas the, the choice select spread is about nine bucks a head. So you get an additional 10, 12 bucks um, for the certified Angus premium over the choice select spread. Again, um, does that pay? The university answer is, is it depends. As a, a beef feeder, as a nutritionist and a nutritionist with my roots in feedlot nutrition, my comment is always that you give me an animal that'll gain four pounds a day and convert at a five to one conversion. And I don't give a damn what color it is. That's the animal that I <laughs> want to feed. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, someone had a follow-up question to the Angus, just why maybe, why are Angus hard to deal with? Why may that be the case? Uh, not all Angus are hard to deal with. Yeah, not all Angus are hard to deal with, but for the majority of angry cattle, I think those are, I find are, are the angriest. You want angry cattle, go down to Brazil and work some Nalori bowls through a feedlot. Uh, hmm. Angus are, Angus are kittens. <laughs> it, any, it, you know, Michael also pointed out in his talk, working with your animals, um, the Angus breed has gotten a very good reputation as a cow breed because of its mothering ability. One of the things that makes it a good mother is that it is protective. Angus are, are protective of their calves. Um, and, and if you want gentle Angus cows, then be among your cows from the time they are, are young heifers. Um, don't be a stranger to your cows and uh, that will go a long way to ensuring um, your ease of handling them later in life. Uh, and the last one I see right now in the chat box is why are Wagyu cattle high in marbling? Genetics, genetics, genetics. It's all about the genetics. It's the same reason some, some humans put on weight around the midsection a little easier than others, right? Um, it all goes back to our moms and our dads and our genetics. Great, we had another question come in actually. Um, we are currently backgrounding steers for the freezer trade. I want an ideal finish of 1250 to 1350. When should I pull the steers from backgrounding ration to a grain-based diet? Can you ask that question again, Ashley? I was putting my uh, email in the chat. Yeah, for sure. We are currently backgrounding steers for the freezer trade. I want an ideal finish of um, 1,250 pounds to 1,350 pounds. When should we pull the steers from a backgrounding ration to a grain-based diet? Great question. Um, the, the university answer is it depends. So how quickly do you wanna get to that 1,250 to 1,350 pounds? You can finish steers, and I showed that in the scenarios that I presented. You can finish steers all the way through on what some folks would consider a backgrounding diet, 30% hay or 40% corn silage. Um, that will not be the most economic option for you. Um, if, but, um, if you want your steers to develop a little bit more frame so that there's more space on that skeletal structure for the meat to position itself um, and for the, the muscle to grow, then keeping those animals on a backgrounding diet until they're seven or 800 pounds prior to transitioning them to a, a finished diet um, is one way to do that. Now, if you want animals truly to finish at 1,250 pounds, um, depending on the genetics of the animals that you're working with, and I would be curious about that, um, you could get to that 1,250 pounds by weaning them onto a grain-based diet and fattening them very quickly um, and do so fairly efficiently. 
Um, again, that depends on the genetics. If you're working with a larger framed animal already, like a limousine or a simmental with some of the older Charlet genetics, those animals will be difficult to finish at 1,250 pounds. So if your target is 1,250 pounds, then you're going to want to focus on more moderate frame genetics in your, your breeding programs or, or in your purchasing um, selections like the Angus genetics or the Hereford genetics and, and even moderate frames among those breeds because our industry average has gotten to where we are slaughtering cattle at 1,450 pounds. Um, and so those, those calves at 1,250, um, we have to select a little bit slighter frame in order to, to, to get the finish that Michael talked about that's going to protect the carcass um, during chilling and aging. Um, at that weight. Great, another question is, uh, is there a benefit to letting calves nurse longer? So it depends on your cow herd. Um, if you have really easy keepers, cows that will maintain their flesh um, very well, then you can keep those calves uh, alongside for a while longer. If you have cows that you have to supplement hard in order to keep the flesh on them through the winter, they will benefit from having those calves pulled off earlier. So it's really not about, um, if you're thinking about the economics of your operation, it shouldn't be about um, what's necessarily best for the calf because you can manage the calf very well in an early weaning situation or a late weaning situation. It becomes about what's best for the cows that you're going to be maintaining long-term at that point. We didn't talk a lot about cow nutrition in this one. It, it sounded like you had a cow program previously, but nationwide about 70% of all the feed that the, the entire beef industry uses in the nation go simply to maintaining the cow herd. That's an astronomical number when you consider that across all systems, feed input costs are 60 to 75% of our costs. Um, and 70% of those input costs are going just to maintain the cow herd. So if you have, again, a cow that is a, a, a poor doer that, that needs a lot of supplemental feed in order to nurse that big calf longer, um, it's better, it's going to be better for you economically to wean those calves um, and get that cow uh, separated from that calf so that she can maintain self at, at a lower nutrient requirement. Great. Um, what are the practical differences between dry hay, hay compared to baleage, assuming they test out about the same? How, how quick you can get it off the field. Um, last year, haylage was where it was at. Um, we could not dry hay last year. It just didn't work out well. Um, and so, so we put up a lot of baleage uh, throughout the Northeast last year. And honestly, um, as long as you get a, a wet bale wrapped tight and stored appropriately with good uh, anaerobic storage, nutritionally, it can be an even better feed um, than dry hay. Um, now, if they're testing about the same, there's no advantage, um, really. Um, let's see. I have some Angus calves that aren't growing well. What can I feed them to help? So nine times out of 10, when I get this extension phone call, it comes back to protein. Um, and, and I hit on protein um, on a concentration versus grams per day intake. But in, in calves that are not growing well, inevitably, when I start to dig into rations, it boils down to protein and, and protein typically is not being fed adequately. If you are feeding um, X forage and simply supplementing with corn grain, it's likely that your growing calves are not getting enough protein to, to grow well. If you are feeding, God forbid, just straight corn silage, there's no way your calves are getting enough protein to grow well. Corn silage is about 6% crude protein. 
Um, and as I showed you in all those examples, particularly the lightweight calves um, need upwards of 13, 14, in some cases, depending on intake, 15% crude protein in their ration to get the appropriate grams per day consumption that is required for lean tissue accretion. Um, and so I would, I would charge you heartily to take a look at your, your protein. So a follow-up, Ashley, um, calves that are sick, and I didn't have this in our hierarchy of nutrient use, but overcoming sickness would be right up there um, with maintenance. That would be considered a maintenance cost of that animal. And so if you've had calves that have battled through the difficult winter that we just had, it was a terrible winter for cattle. Um, lots of pneumonia, lots of coughing, uh, lots of temperature swings that just wreak havoc on the consistency that cattle crave to grow appropriately. Um, those calves will be putting and diverting all, that, um, all those six nutrients that they need for growth and development into overcoming that sickness. And it doesn't matter if you think they already overcame the sickness, if they've come through a particularly difficult bout of sickness, research data shows that they will gain about a half a pound less than cattle that have never been treated uh, throughout the entire course of their lifespan every single day, simply because they've had a difficult go with sickness. Great, thank you. Um, what type of grain do you recommend with a dry hay finish? Access to corn silage is limited. How much grain per head per day? Depends on your, uh, what you're trying to do. Um, if you're trying to, to finish uh, those calves in the most economic scenario, uh, that would be the 10% hay limit that I showed. Um, nationwide, I should have pointed that out. Uh, the reason that I use 10% um, that's actually a little bit high. Nationwide roughage inclusion in feedlot cattle diets, conventional feedlot cattle diets, averages 8%. And that's actually up a tick in recent years from what it used to be at around six and a half, seven percent 7%. Um, there's a reason for that. Forage is expensive and it takes up space. It slows down rate of gain. Now that's not to say that you can't grass finish animals. As Michael pointed out, they, they can be quality eating experiences, um, but it is a different market. And you have to realize, as he also pointed out, those animals will finish at an older age. Um, and, and you have to account for that then in the, the balance of the economics for your operation. Um, I would encourage anyone that has this level of detail questions to reach out to me directly. I'm going to go ahead and put uh, my office number in the chat as well. I included my email, but I know my slides are no longer up. So I'm going to put my office number in the chat as well. And I'd be happy to take um, phone calls if, if you really want to dig into some details. One of the things that I remind all of the, the producers that I work with daily in uh, Pennsylvania is that I am a party of one. We have 12,000 beef producers just in Pennsylvania. If I wow. spent uh, a day every day formulating 40 rations, I wouldn't get to everybody in a year, right? Um, there's a tremendous benefit to working with a local qualified nutritionist that understands the, the feed prices in your area. Working with an, a local nutritionist, that nutritionist will um, test hay samples for you to make sure that it's not just about feeding hay. Remember, it's about feeding those nutrients. So what are the carbohydrates, proteins, and minerals that are in your hay? Um, it, it really doesn't matter. The, the fact that you're feeding hay really doesn't matter. It's the nutrients that you're feeding that really matter. Um, and working with that local qualified nutritionist can really help you dig into that uh, whole farm picture uh, a lot better. Great, thank you. And the last question I see right now is, and it might be one that you want uh, to answer, you know, uh, separately, but is brewer's grain good for for beef cattle? It's phenomenal, absolutely. If you have access to brewer's grains, particularly as we have seen this kind of micro brew burst um, or micro brew bubble happening, um, 
a lot of those smaller micro brews pay a, a takeaway fee for those brewers grains. And they would much rather you come and pick it up and take it away for free than have to pay a takeaway fee. Um, brewers grains are typically high in protein. They're very high in energy. They're high in soluble uh, fiber, which the, the ruminant animal can use very readily. Um, and so feeding, feeding those at about, um, about five pounds of dry matter, or if it's a, a wet product that you're picking up, you know, eight to 10 pounds of that wet product um, per day can really be a great way to meet the protein needs of, and, and energy needs of your cattle. If you feed much more than that to cows, they'll get dumpy fat. But I've done research projects where I have fed feedlot animals 50% of their ration dry matter as brewer's grains and, and they grow like gangbusters. Great, thank you. Um, I keep saying it's the last question, but then we, I think uh, as you talk, it spurs more thought. So I do have That's another. Fine. That's uh, fine. <laughs> why do you feed a higher percentage of protein to a calf than a finishing animal? Great question. So I don't know, Michael, is, is it okay if I put my slides back up? I wanna just pull back up that, that slide about protein concentration uh, versus consumption. Because we went through these slides, I thought I only had 30 minutes. So I went through these really quickly, I apologize. Um, the, the protein grams per day is really what it boils down to because calves don't require a, a concentration. So we can talk all day about concentration, but the bottom line is that calves require grams per day crude protein. And generally for a calf gaining about uh, 300 pounds, or excuse me, 300 pounds, a calf, a calf gaining about three pounds a day, it doesn't matter whether that calf is 550 pounds or whether that calf is uh, 700 pounds, that calf gaining three pounds a day requires somewhere in the neighborhood of 800 to 850 grams of crude protein. Remember that there are 454 grams in one pound. So you're pushing close to two pounds of crude protein required per day. So if I share this PowerPoint slide again, and, and we just kind of do a walkthrough of this calculation for anyone that's interested. If I put back in, let's say I changed this example back to a 700 pound animal consuming 2% of its body weight, right? So we didn't change the concentration at all, but simply because that animal is 700 pounds and consuming 2% of its body weight, if I get my good nutritionist always has their calculator right at their fingertips, right? So if I multiply um, that out, um, I get my 14 pounds, not much different than the two and a half pounds that that calf was consuming, um, my 14 pounds. And I'm gonna get pretty close to, I did this math earlier. I know that it's 846 uh, grams of crude protein roughly. Now let's take that same calf. And now let's say we've got an 1100 pound animal. Well, that 1100 pound animal consuming, a, if it is still consuming a 13% crude protein diet, now it's eating 22 pounds. Now we've got 22 pounds. We take that 22 times 0.13. My fingers are, my mouth is working faster than my fingers. Now we're at 2.86 pounds or 1200, uh, call it 1300 uh, grams of crude protein. Now that animal is grossly consuming above that 850 pounds that it requires. And if we do that same calculation kind of in reverse format, right? We say, okay, we need 854 pounds. That's about two pounds a day. What we'll find is that animal, and it's easy math because it's 22 pounds of intake, right? If it's two pounds a day, we find that that animal requires only about 10 and a half percent crude protein in the diet, not 13% to achieve that eight and a half uh, or 850 grams of crude protein intake. So, um, I always say this is cowboy math, right? It's not, <laughs> I laugh because last, last summer I was at a wedding and I said, oh, I, 
I was this guy that was walking me down the aisle seemed real jittery, right? My husband was kind of giving him the stink eye from the side and he had to walk me down the aisle. And I was like, dude, relax. Um, uh, we were talking about what it is you do. And I said, well, I'm a beef cattle nutritionist. He said, oh, that's cool. And I said, yeah, I just always tell the students it's animal science, not rocket scientists, no, rocket science. And, and so we, we use simple algebra and cowboy math. And I said, a few minutes later, go by and I go, so what do you do? He goes, I'm a rocket scientist. I'm like, oh, that's great. <laughs> so uh, it is, but it takes time and it takes practice, right? It takes time and it takes practice to think about these concentrations versus grams per day. And I would encourage you just to write down a few scenarios for yourself. How big are your calves now? What are they eating if they're consuming 2% of their body weight? What are they eating if they're consuming 3% of their body weight? What are they eating if they're only getting that 7% corn silage versus the 42% uh, crude protein in soybeans? Um, just kind of walk through a couple of those scenarios in your mind until it starts to become commonplace to think about uh, grams per day instead of concentrations. Great. I don't see any more questions. We have a lot of thank yous in the chat box though. Everyone loved both of your presentations. Thank you both. We're very welcome. And thank you again for the opportunity. Um, when Mary Lynn called me, I said, it's important to be good neighbors. So I hope uh, Cornell Extension can, can come down and visit our, our folks in Pennsylvania soon. That sounds like a fine arrangement, Tara. I appreciate that offer. And uh, thank you once again for uh, tonight's presentations. And thank you uh, also, Michael, for your time and your presentation. You. And I think like so many of us here on this Zoom meeting tonight, working with cattle, uh, I don't know about you, but my mornings start pretty early. So I think uh, with that, I think we'll wrap it up, folks. Uh, this will be recorded. Uh, and we'll be sure to share that link uh, to the recording as it becomes available. Um, and so just a big final thank you to everyone for joining us and thank you to our presenters and please feel free to reach out uh, with any follow-up questions or concerns uh, with that we will sign off and thank you so much for joining us tonight <laughs>